Good morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order the regularly scheduled February 14th, 2023 meeting of the Board of Supervisors. Madam Clerk, if we could begin with a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Here. Cummings? Here. Hernandez? Here. McPherson? Here. And Fred? Here. I would like to begin uh, with a moment of silence. Does any board member like to dedicate a moment of silence? Supervisor Koenig, please. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. I'd like to dedicate this moment to Buzz Roberts. He's a beloved member of our community. He uh, he passed away over the weekend, and uh, he taught guitar. He's a loving husband, and he's survived by his wife, Kate Roberts. Thank you. Any other members? Okay, I'd like to dedicate this moment of silence, please. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, Mr. Palacios. Sir. Are there any changes to today's agenda? Uh, we have no corrections today. Thank you, Mr. Palacios. Um, are there any board members that would like to pull an item on consent and put it on the regular agenda today? Okay, seeing none, we'd like to open it up now for public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on either items that are not on today's agenda, but are within the purview of the Board of Supervisors, or on the consent agenda, or on the regular agenda if you're unable to stay, or even on the closed session agenda if you're unable to be here for that time. Please step forward. Good morning. Welcome. Hi, my name is Carol Bjorn. Happy Valentine's Day to everybody. Um, and because it's Valentine's Day, I thought I would just give a quick reminder of our relationship. And I'd like to do that by reading Government Code 54950. Um, in enacting this chapter, the legislature finds and declares that the public commissions boards and councils and the other public agencies in this state exist to aid in the conduct of the people's business. It is the intent of the law that their actions be taken openly and that their deliberations be conducted openly. The people of this state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them. And I think that sentence bears repeating. The people of this state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them. The people in delegating authority do not give their public servants the right to decide what is good for the people to know and what is good for them to, to, to not know. The people insist on remaining informed so that they may retain control over the instruments that they've created. Um, and then my second point has to do with the cell towers. So I'd like to ask for a moratorium on any cell towers in this county until an appropriate health and safety study be conducted. And um, Supervisor Hernandez, I know there's some cell towers going up in South County right now. And my good friend Diane had reached out to your office to meet with you about that. Um, I know Marilyn Garrett calls in every time you guys have a meeting and she talks about the dangers of the cell towers. If you go outside this building and look at all the trees around the building, they're dying. And it's because of all the cell towers and Wi-Fi on top of this building. So if it's happening to the trees, imagine what it's doing to the people. So I'd like to ask for a moratorium on any cell towers in Santa Cruz County until you guys know exactly what the effects of the trees, um, the people and the animals and the environmental concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Uh, good morning, supervisors, and thank you for your service and welcome Board Supervisor Cummings and Hernandez. Uh, I have the honor and privilege of uh, working and being chair of the Mental Health Advisory Board for about a decade now. Um, I'm here to tell you we've submitted the uh, California Mental Health Data Notebook that's required every year. This year it focuses on services that we lost due to COVID. Um, you know, our staff are doing amazingly great work, very understaffed and doing the best that they can with the impact that not only COVID, but at the rains and the fires have had and how you guys have had to be there to help uh, us. I also want to point out and thank you very much for the approval of Tiffany Kendrell Warren. She and Karen Kern have been working very hard in Trump directors and having her step up and how closely she's worked with the board has been amazing. I also want to say thank you for keeping the Watsonville Hospital and... Oh. 
that goes into my time. Um, and uh, working forward on the Youth Mental Health Crisis Stabilization Center, which is going to be an amazing asset to our community. And I believe it's uh, they're looking at it at the Sheriff Center near Santa Clara. So thank you guys very much for your service. Um, any questions, uh, feel free to reach me, Mental Health Advisory Board. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Good morning, sir. Welcome. <clears throat> Good morning. I'm Lou Brizzuto, a 72-year resident of this county. Been a contractor in this county for 45 years. I'm here representing my client who I'm trying to build her house that burned above the Boulder Creek golf course. And uh, I don't know if this county has ever known what an emergency is. But uh, at best, your planning department and uh, uh, Four Leaf are in the way right now. Uh, you, you've got a thousand people out of their homes for uh, going on three years now. Now you've got flood and landslide victims. And uh, many jurisdictions in this state lift their, re uh, their uh, regulations. Uh, for instance, Ferndale in their 90s earthquake uh, waived all permits and fees and told people, get in your homes, do whatever you have to do. We're here if you need us. Just give us a call. For some reason, starting with the floods of the 80s and the earthquakes, and, and uh, now we've got uh, this fire, the county of Santa Cruz has never been an emergency-oriented uh, uh, people. You've always got in the way. Now, if you want to know my exact uh, experience of my 45 years in this county, 72 years, actually, I was born here, my phone number is 408-590-2946. I would highly suggest Mr. McPherson and Mr. Cummins call me because this involves your area of the county. And I'm highly, highly dis disappointed in the performance of this government, especially when I spend thousands of dollars of my client's money to get her in a house and you guys spend her money like drunken sailors. Please call me. You have to know what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody else like to address us this morning? Good morning. Yeah, good morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. Those are some interesting um, initials. So on the consent agenda, you know, in item 19, there's an AMBAG meeting, um, and it relates to that on February 27th, 10 to noon. It's one of the... Um, you know, overseeing governments that people don't really talk about. So how about three sevens? 1917, 1937, and 1987. So in 1917, what kind of changed is city council members and county boards of supervisors became under the control like puppets of uh, city and county managers. I'm sure that the attorney can confirm that. I have some information. It's not with me. So, you know, it kind of reminds me of Pinocchio. You guys are kind of on strings. You know, the tales that you guys tell, you guys would have noses the sizes of the longest freight trains that are run by um, diesel electric, you know, and talk about sustainability, 51 seconds, you know, hemp seeds. That oil can be replaced diesel, kerosene, or jet fuel. We can thank William Randolph Hearst for getting rid of hemp. Let's see, I have 30 seconds left. You know, there are some lies in this county that their noses could just go around the world. I'm thinking of Carlos Palacios. It's really pretty sad. You know, there's many ways to stop the conversations in a room. You know, we all have creator energies and are all fifth elements. We are all part of earth, fire, wind, and earth, fire, wind, and rain. And that fifth element is love. It is Valentine's Day. So, you know, imagine Snow White sitting on Pinocchio's face. Tell me a lie, Pinocchio. Tell me a lie. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. Didn't get to finish that. Good morning. Can I give uh, uh, this follow-up on my last conversation for you? Good morning. 
Some of you know how long I've been trying to bring a structure in the county. Different than for high school, that would be to age 25. So I have a letter that I had talked about. I have the video of how was it five years ago where I spoke to at that time the board. I haven't changed, but I'm 84 years young. I haven't given up. That letter that is being given for you later is from Susan, the for former administrator, as you know, like you, Carlos. And it was back in 1985. Please read it. If you didn't take action when I spoke for the three minutes of creating a countywide structure for youth, please think through what each of you could do that I can't. And so on the other side is basically what I'm going to read as an open invitation, because on the 30th of this month, the founder of the United Farm Workers, they're still trying to pass legislation. I want you to know that the Latino Affairs Commission, not that we're dealing with one population, they couldn't even get a quorum and they meet only every other month. You have an opportunity at Cabrillo because they'll be electing their student senate. You judge a society by how the young people get involved in a democracy. So best I can, you can't do it in three minutes. But if I got seven seconds, is that accurate? Four seconds? <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Please look at the other side of what you could do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Gary, Richard Arnold. Good morning, Chairman, Supervisors. Um, I think we heard ever since uh, we've got some new supervisors here uh, before. Uh, people are talking about three minutes. Ever since Ryan Coonerty, it seems like the uh, Panetta machine has chopped people's communications to you by two minutes. Also, people could be able to reach you. You know, you all have the same damn phone number. And before, just a few years ago, um, there was a planning department. There was a planning appeals board. This board of supervisors abolished it and pointed themselves. That's why people are suffering out here and not having representative government. You belong to a secret parallel government called CalCog. And they are complaining about the California Constitution. I don't know whose news it's coming from, but AMBAG, which is a COG, a council of governments, it's no more than a Soviet, meets, and they only have, that's 13 cities and three counties. You know how many agendas they have for the people that show up last time I went? Six. You people are cheating the American people. You belong to CalCog that is lobbying against the California Constitution. I don't know how that's damn legal. And 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 in the CalCog, uh, they even have a flag. Uh, Pacifica, Bruce McPherson's communications director is advocating a, a Soviet nation called Pacifica on the West Coast. Um, they're they're attacking. <laughs> The Constitution is anachronistic, and it leads to costly elections. Elections, people, they, these people don't believe in elections. They're meeting secretly, and they're funded through ICLEI, which is a front for the, both the World Bank and the United Nations. And these people are evil. They're lying to you. They're not elected representatives. And for God's sakes, get your own telephone number and one for your assistants like there used to be. You're, you're pimps for the Thank you, uh, Arnold. global government. Thank you. Is there anybody else that'd like to address us right now during public comment? Okay, so seeing none, we'll close public comment. We'll bring it to the board Chair. for action. Chair, we. I'm sorry, that was my mistake. Sorry, Madam Clerk. Is there anybody online? Yes, Chair. Thank you. We do have speakers online. Call in user one. Your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, and thanks to the speakers and Carol Bjorn reminding you that your 
responsibility is to represent the public. At your meeting on January 10th, I urge the new supervisors especially to halt the installation of hazardous 5G radiation assault antennas and towers throughout our county. And I see that item 14 lists Cruz I.O. receiving $500,000 to install it and listing 20 sites where this is um, happening. And to remind you that no resident and or child has authorized 24-7 involuntary bodily microwave radiation trespass. We do not stand to these violations of our, I don't know what's happening with the voice, privacy, health, constitutional, property rights. Halt installation and remove the dangers of these towers. Murder towers is what they are. Toxic radiation. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers online? Yes, Chair. Brian, your microphone is now available. Hi, this is uh, Brian Peoples from Trail Now, hard in the back. Um, but I want to recognize, I heard the gentleman contracting, contracting for 50 years, and I just want to, uh, you know, recognize his frustration. And that I think it's important that the county listen to the frustration of the community that have lost their home. Um, it's very frustrating to hear him come up in front of the board and mention the 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 pushback and the inability to build rebuild the home. So I just really want to encourage the board to think about this individual who took the time to come before you and express his um his frustrations and they're true frustrations and i know the board wants to help so um just wanted to recognize it and thank him for coming in front of the board thank you mondo your microphone is now available good morning gentlemen i would like to uh, address number eight on the agenda rebuilding after the disaster um, our failure to rebuild these lost homes after these disasters is a simple symptom of a larger problem. We as a community are made up mostly of small and pop homeowners and landlords. Yet the previous boards for decades have continued to make it more expensive to both build and maintain our housing stock. They've done so with restrictive zoning, and unnecessarily difficult building requirements. As a result, our mom and pop contractors have left. And now when we need them the most, they're no longer here. We must address these issues. Some of them include $50,000 to put in a septic system. We have to look into that, it's too much money. $50,000 for a geological study for a single home. We have to take a look at that. Tens of thousands of dollars to hook up to water or other utilities. We have to take a look at that. Permits that are multiple times the cost of the national average. We got to take a look at that. Zoning and building codes that are more restrictive even than our neighboring counties. We have to take a look at that. And honestly, though, I've been encouraged by the efforts of some of our newest members. Thank you, Manu, for the tiny houses and the incinerating toilet, toilet program. Felipe, uh, your efforts in doubling the number of ADUs allowed in Watsonville, we stand and salute you. Justin, a couple weeks ago, you talked about uh, using SB9 and ABU policies to help address our arena issues. 
I hope to work with you to use this valuable tool to help us. And lastly, um, hope we keep this hybrid. I'm at a job site right now, and if uh, I had to come in, I wouldn't have time. Thank you. Um, are we still on public comment? I'm hearing an echo that I didn't hear before. Is it your sound system? We're working. We'll work on that. Is there any other? Are there any other speakers online? No. Thank you, Chair. All right. Thank you. We will now close public. I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm Actually, sorry. we've had we have one member in oh, chambers and one more online that just arrived. All right, we'll start with Chambers and move back to online. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks for taking comment early because I have to get back to work. Uh, I live in Bonnie Dune. I was displaced after the fires um, and was looking to get back in to a lot to build a small house for myself. Um, the stories that I've heard from other people in Bonnie Dune and my experience when I was looking at a lot and learning about the process... I ended up not buying in because I was so concerned about it, it septic system changes, costs that I hadn't accounted for. And I'm still without a place to be permanently. I'm living in a combination of a trailer and a one-room cabin. I have friends who have gone through the permit process. And while it seems that the permits themselves, as far as building are concerned, seem to move quickly, there seems to be a real bog down in the pre-permitting process. And I know people are really frustrated and don't really have the money to handle these, what seem to be, you know, things that really aren't in keeping with what you all had hoped to do as far as helping facilitate rebuilding. Uh, and I can't speak specifically to things other than my experience with septic permitting, but it seems like that whole pre-process is a mess. And I would really love to see it change because I'd like to get into a lot. I'd like to be able to live in Bonnie Dune long term. And I'd like to see the folks that I've watched go through this process be able to rebuild. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. Now move back to the speaker online, please. Colin, use your two. Your microphone is now available. Hello? Yes, Hi, we can, can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, I'm hearing a terrible echo. So I'm a little rattled by that. So don't start my two minutes yet. I, I don't. No, I don't. I'm on, and I'm on a regular phone, no speaker phone. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So I'm calling concerning the proposed um, agenda item 14. Uh, although I'm not against the board having, uh, you know, approved money for uh, internet and broadband, I would like that to be wired not wireless. The reason why is because we have been absolutely taken to town by the FCC since 1998. There was a major U.S. Court of Appeals decision for the D.C. Circuit published on August 13th, 2021. The court ruled that the FCC failed to consider non-cancer evidence regarding adverse health effects of wireless technology when it decided its 1996 radio frequency emission guidelines. This case that the Court of Appeals ruled, in, ruled that in 2021 has been going on for eight, 10 years. Here's what the court said. The FCC completely failed to acknowledge, let alone respond to, comments concerning the impact of radio frequency radiation on the environment and people. I'm adding in the on people. Uh, to go back to the quote, the record contains substantive evidence of potential environmental harm, 
Now, by environmental, they're talking also about health effects. Health effects. The, the, the record for that court case has thousands of studies presented to the court about health effects and biological effects on people, on animals, and trees. Thank you. Thank you for calling in with your comments. Are there any additional speakers online? No, Chair. All right. No one in the chambers. We will now close public comment and bring it back to the board uh, for action on consent. Supervisor Cummings. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to start. I had one comment um, on, on item number 33, which is the telecare contract. I just wanted to thank um, the health services uh, director and their staff uh, for helping us with one of our constituent concerns related to uh, telecare and, and the care that was provided there. Um, aside from that, I just also wanted to mention that, um, well, first, happy Valentine's Day. And as part of Valentine's Day, I actually have to go officiate a wedding. So I'm going to need to leave um, after we vote on the consent items. So just wanted to make sure that folks were aware of that. And my apologies for not being able to be here the entire time. Thanks, Supervisor Cummings. Uh, Supervisor Hernandez, do you have any comments on consent? Please. I just wanted to acknowledge that, that um, we have our planning commissioner that's being that's being uh, pointed today, Judy Lazenby. So I want to you know thank her for all her service as well. Um, She's been doing the duty for several years already, so she's going to continue uh, to do it. Uh, I'm not sure she's, how long she wants to do it for, but she wants to continue to do it. So thank her for her service. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to thank the Parks Department on item 35 for the proposal to create a lifeguard hiring incentive program. You know, we've seen a real difficulty in hiring across uh, all of our agencies and departments in the public sector as a com uh, as we've seen the, the collision of the COVID crisis, uh, folks retiring, making it more difficult uh, to provide trainings, as well as the housing crisis locally and people not being able to afford to live here. Um, so we've seen programs like this $500 incentive program where we're proposing for lifeguards work um, in other positions such as correctional officers um, and uh, actually Metro drivers as well. We just got a bunch of new uh, applications for recruits there. Um, so I'm hopeful we can do the same for lifeguards um, because just having county facilities closed 40% of the time uh, and, and these huge cuts in terms of uh, number of swim classes down at 20% of average, it's, um, it's really devastating to the community. So hopefully we can turn it around. Thank you for those comments, Supervisor Koenig. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. On item 32, I would like to congratulate um, Tiffany Contrell Warren for her appointment to Director of Behavioral Health. We appreciate everything uh, that she has done in the interim role for the last several months. And personally, I believe that how this county and how this state and nation addresses behavioral health is as important in addressing our homeless problem as building more housing. Uh, so it's a critical uh, position in the county, and I really appreciate her her uh, foresight and her professionalism in taking that role. Uh, I, I too would like to to thank uh, Telecare. Uh, on a related note, uh, the uh, behavioral health uh, for bringing this item forward to sharing with the board the challenges being faced by telecare and serving those with mental uh, health challenges. It certainly is not easy work and we know that telecare has had some challenges retaining staff. So I'm glad we can offer this additional resource and monetary support to telecare. Uh, it's a critical component of how we address um, our our uh, the uh, the homeless issue as I mentioned and uh, it's, it's very much appreciated that they've stepped forward. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. I'd also like to welcome uh, Tiffany Cantrell Warren. It's hard to imagine a more important role in our county right now than Behavioral Health Director, and, and I believe that she's going to do an outstanding job. I'd just like to also thank Public Works on Item 39, which is storm damage repair work, 2017 storm damage repair work, and there's still Public Works is still sticking on all the significant over $125 million of damage that we had at that time, and obviously we had a lot. That was just added on, but I appreciate the work of Mr. Wiesner and the entire team uh, for that. Uh, so I'll move it back to the board for a motion. Supervisor Cummings. I'll move consent. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Cummings and a second from Supervisor Koenig. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Friend. Aye. Consent agenda passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
All right, we're gonna begin with the very first item on the regular agenda, which is to consider approval of plans, specifications, and engineer's estimate for the SoCal Drive buffered bike lane and congested mitigation project to set the bid opening for 2 15 p.m. on March 16th, 2023, direct the community development and infrastructure to return by April 25th, 2023, with a recommendation for award of the contract and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the Deputy CAO Director of Community Development and Infrastructure. We have the board memo, the plans, the specs, and the notice to contractors. And presenting here today, we have Russell Chen, our senior civil engineer. Welcome, Mr. Chen. Good to see you back. Let's go, Brandon, members of Make sure your mic's on the green, the button. There's a gray button at the base of your microphone on the. Oh, there. <laughs> <clears throat> Hello, Chair Friend and members of the board. My name is Russell Chen. I'm with Community Development and Infrastructure. I'm here to present the SoCal Drive Buffered Bike Lane Congestion Mitigation Project. Next slide, please. Yeah, right there at that. Oh, this one. These are our key members of the of the project. We have Steve Wiesner, myself, and Tim Wynn with the County of Santa Cruz, and then Sean O'Keefe and Daniel Bloomquist with Mark Thomas. Um, like to give a special shout out to Tim Wynn for his efforts in um, getting the project to this point for ready for construction. I'm gonna go over existing conditions, goals, budget, project overview, schedule, and then at the end, we'll have questions and answers. This project is on SoCal Avenue, SoCal Drive, and it goes from La Fonda to State Park Drive, it is 5.6 miles in one direction, it is four lane roadway with uh, two way left turn lanes uh, for the most, part of this project. Um, we have high volumes. As you know, when Highway 1 gets congested, traffic uh, spills onto uh, SoCal Avenue, SoCal Drive. We unofficially sometimes call it Highway 2. We have high speeds despite 35 mile per hour speed limits. We also have uh, transit delays due to congestion. We have existing sidewalk gaps and ADA ramps that were built to previous standards. So those are some of the general conditions um, or, that we have on SoCal Avenue, SoCal Drive. Our project goals, our number one goal is safety. Um, we think this project will address some of the concerns on SoCal Avenue, SoCal Drive. We also wanted to reduce traffic congestion, um, which will increase um, corridor throughput reduce greenhouse gas emissions, improve emergency response times, um, improve access to housing, schools, jobs, and medical facilities. And then we also, it'll also um, promote sustainable transport uh, development. And then our other goal is to improve active transportation connectivity. A little bit about, um, a little background on the project. This project is part of the Watsonville to Santa Cruz Multimodal Corridor Program. That this came out of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation's Unified Corridor Investment Study. And this identified projects on SoCal Avenue, SoCal Drive, Highway 1, Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line. I also want to note that RTC did extensive um, outreach in developing this study. And for this project, we partnered with RTC in 2020 for Highway 1 and SoCal Drive improvements, and we received over $100 million for both projects, including $16.5 million for SoCal Avenue, SoCal Drive project. And this was from the state's Solutions for Congested Corridors grant. I want to thank RTC in, in helping us um, get this grant. Our budget for this project, we had um, 16 and a half million from the congested corridors grant and nine million from county funds for a total of 25.5 million. 
And this includes design, right of way, and construction. Before we jump into the project overview, um, just want to let you know the project doesn't widen SoCal Drive. Um, we're, we're, what we're doing was we're reimagining what we can do within the curb space that we have. So this project goes again from La Fonda to State Park Drive. We have uh, 21 um, intersections with traffic signals that we are going to be improving bike pet and signalize intersection improvements. We also have bike and pet improvements similar to what the city has done on Water Street. And then I'll go into a little bit more detail in the following slides. For the bike improvements, we have 2.4 miles of class four separated bikeways. It's a two foot buffer minimum with delineators, vertical delineators, as you can see in the um, the the picture on the right hand side there. We also have 2.7 miles of buffered bike lanes. These are um, class two bike lanes with one to two foot buffers without the vertical separators. And then we also have 27 bike boxes at various intersections along SoCal Avenue, SoCal Drive. For the pedestrian improvements, we have 0.6 miles of sidewalk gap closures. And then we have almost 100 ADA ramp upgrades, and this is to meet current ADA standards. And then we'll have 70 crosswalk upgrades. This will enhance crosswalks and signages for both pedestrians and motorists awareness. And then we have 11 mid-block crosswalk RFBs or rectangular rapid flashing beacons. And for bus and vehicular improvements, we have transit signal priorities. This will enhance our transit signal or transit reliability. And then we also have adaptive signals. This will manage congestion and increase corridor throughput. And then we'll also have pavement rehabilitation. We actually have a um, micro seal as part of this project. And this will increase longevity of the pavement and will also. Um, give us a blank canvas for new striping. All right, so we have a cross section here. This is what is being proposed as part of this project. Um, again, we're working within the curb to curb, existing curb to curb space. And uh, we'll, we had to narrow down some of the traffic travel lanes so that we can install um, a two foot buffer where we can. And then I uh, wanted to highlight uh, Cabrillo College area. Um, in the top cross section is the existing condition. The bottom is what the, the bottom cross section is what, be, is what is being proposed by the project. And you can see that we're removing parking along the Cabrillo College area so that we can install a class four separated bikeway. And we worked extensively with Cabrillo College in the removal of the parking in this area. I also wanted to highlight SoCal Drive because of the um, constraints that we have here. Um, the, narrow, the lanes are already narrowed down in this area. So we weren't able to actually add buffer or separated bikeways in this um, corridor. Um, but what we did was um, we enhanced the bike lanes with uh, green bike lanes. Um, also enhanced the crosswalks with high visibility crosswalks. And then um, added some two-stage bike boxes. So we're gonna be going into construction um, in the near future. And some of the things to anticipate are some lane closures along the um, lane closures, and then also some shoulders that will be closed, some temporary restriping, um, some impacts to driveways and side streets and then some intermittent um, utility interruptions. But we're gonna try to maintain bike and pedestrian access.
our anticipated construction duration is 12 to 18 months. Our project schedule, um, we completed preliminary engineering 2021, final design is September 2022, and the right of way was actually October 2022 and not 23. And uh, we're anticipating starting construction the summer of 2023. And I'd like to, um, a recommended action for this item is approve the plan specification and engineer's estimate and authorize calling for bids for SoCal Drive buffer bike lane and congestion mitigation project. Set bid opening for 215 on March 16, 2023, in the Department of Community Development and Infrastructure. Direct the clerk of the board to advertise the notice to contractors for 10 days beginning February 19, 2023, per the provisions of the Cal of Public Contract Code, Section 20392, and direct community development and infrastructure return on April 25, 2023, with recommendation for award of the contract. Questions? Thank you, Mr. Chen. Let me begin by saying how significant of a project this is for our community. And a few years ago, uh, the deputy CAO, Mr. Machado, and I were able to testify to the California Transportation Commission for this funding. And it's the largest state investment, the largest state investment in a multimodal transportation in Santa Cruz County's history. It helps address significant issues in the mid-county of safety, uh, in particular around some of the elementary schools that have sidewalk gaps and crosswalk issues. Uh, our county, as we know, has one of the highest rates of vehicle v. ped and vehicle v. Uh, bike incidents in the state of California, and this will help address that. And for those of us that represent also the South County, this will help on the bus side improve the transportation time and elements along SoCal in a way that has never been done before. And this is something that what I would really like to appreciate Public Works for. I recognize Mr. Wiesner isn't also here right now, but these are uh, these were direct requests from the community. I mean, the, the 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 vision for this project came from requests from the community over the last decade or so. Very specific asks you. Mr. Wiesner and others built that into the project application to the state. We got funded from the state and here we are. It's, it's really government working at its finest. I'd like to appreciate you on that. Uh, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair Friend. I, I just wanna echo that the emphasis that this really is an incredibly important project. We talk about housing all the time and the need to build more of it. Of course, uh, a lot of the potential for some of that housing is in the mid-county area, but whenever I bring it up, at uh, speaking with the public, they, the first thing folks ask is, but we don't have the infrastructure for it. Where, how, uh, traffic is already so bad. How are we going to add more people here if we don't uh, get the traffic moving and people can't get around? And this is always one of the answers on the tip of my tongue because it's such a huge investment. I mean, these 20, 21 automated signals um, that will help improve traffic flow on, you know, as you fictionally called it, Highway 2. Uh, and I know some of those have already gone in and that there's also coordination with the city of Capitola over uh, the, the 41st overpass on Highway 1. And of course, we're working with Caltrans as well, so some of those signals are theirs. Um, but, you know, so much work is going into this to make sure that tra um, traffic moves better and also that we reduce these bike and safety, uh, bike and pedestrian collisions, which a supervisor friend mentioned uh, were one of the worst counties in the state for, and a lot of those accidents are happening on SoCal Drive. So it's really important to focus on this corridor. And I think it bears mention that um, since I'm sure many of you have seen uh, the construction starting on Highway 1, or at least some of the pre-construction there with the trees uh, being removed to make way for the bus on shoulder and auxiliary lane project. And that's really the second piece of this, right? I mean, this massive investment in improved transportation infrastructure for the mid-county area. And of course, the reason we've been able to pull all these state and federal funds, right? I mean, a note on the federal funds, the, the last portion of that highway project, we just received a $30 million grant from the federal government, one of uh, only nine mega projects uh, I believe nationwide and the only one in California. And the reason we've been so successful at pulling these state and federal monies is because of our community's vision to build a multimodal transportation network and to then 
fund that vision with uh, the half cent sales tax measure D that was passed in 2016. So just uh, really looking forward to seeing this project get underway. I did have one question. I know the reason this item is coming before us today is because uh, the original bids that we received on it were too high. Um, and despite you know having a, committed a lot of funds to it, we didn't have quite that much. And so we're looking at a couple segments of sidewalk as as alternates um, or basically optional um, add-ons. Um, now, I know we had done extensive work with some of the residents along SoCal Drive near Robinson uh, to acquire easements have, have we completed that easement acquisition so that if um you know even if we don't build a sidewalk and this round of construction it can be done by you know a future housing project or something to that effect yeah we have uh acquired those easements uh permanent easements however the temporary easements we will have to go back if we come back with a future project we'll have to go back with temporary easements for the construction part but for the permanent we already have those that's great. I mean, hopefully we can get it done with uh, all at once, but if not, it's nice to know that we've at least done a lot of the hard work and had had those conversations, acquired those easements so that um, we, we can eventually build those other segments of sidewalk too. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, Supervisor Koenig. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a big deal. I mean, we've had the widening of sections of Highway 1, um, had rail trail discussions that are going on, on, but this is really as important as anything of meeting the transportation needs of the future in this era of climate change. Uh, I think it can't be overstated uh, how important this is going to be for the future transportation needs of Santa, people in Santa Cruz County. And I really appreciate the importance of uh, Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission and meeting with Metro, of which a few, some of us are members as well, uh, to recognize the need there and then probably enhance the uh, more people traveling by bus uh, and, and getting there on time. Um, and although the project uh, we're approving today is just one piece of a larger multi, uh, modal effort, um, it will demonstrate that really we're, we're thinking in the right way of the kind of planning for the future. Uh, I, uh, I want to thank the CDI staff for its creative value engineering, in which uh, you have a great team and Steve Wiesner in particular. Uh, and I look forward to seeing the construction to start this summer. It's going to cause some congestion in the process, but uh, it'll be much, much worth it in the in the long run. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Hernandez. I want to thank staff for putting this project together and, and accessing the money for it too. It's uh it's we've been as a county really successful at getting these multimodal projects. And I have to say that it's really transformative of communities to get these these bike and pedestrian projects because it makes it brings the community out and it brings families out and it makes it safer to walk and bike and that's when people come out of their homes and walk around their neighborhoods walk to the shopping center walk to school walk their kids to the local school and we want to see more of that you know uh it that's what builds community um and it makes it safe of course for people to walk and it makes it safe for drivers as well so I want to thank you for, you know, all that work. And I have to thank, you know, that we're going to facilitate and fast track the buses that go in and out from uh, Watsonville to, to Cabrillo as well. Uh, we need to make sure that the buses get there on time and students get there on time. And I'm thankful that we're going to have some fiber, uh, fiber optic laid down there, too, so that we have some fast Internet around that college as well. Um, my question is, uh, do we, I was trying to find a map that has the 21 crosswalks and I'm, I'm sure that there's a, a good significant amount of input from the community when people, um, were asking for the, uh, the flash beacon crosswalks as well. I know in South Carolina, we get a lot of input for like flash beacon crosswalks and a lot of requests for flash beacon crosswalks. I know we got a lot of input for uh, green Valley road, especially around the parks, um, but did we do we have a map on there? I was trying to find one. So the so the map here will show the um the rectangular wrapping flash and beacons, the new ones at um that are green dots. I don't know if you can see that.
So we already have some existing rectangular rapid flashing beacons. And then the green ones are the, are the new ones. Well, at, the the new, those are at the new crosswalks. And then the yellow ones are at the existing crosswalks. Okay. So these are all the mid block cross crossings. Oh, I see. And so um, at the existing intersections, um, a lot of them are, a lot of these are signalized that are on here. And then, so the ones that are highlighted here are the crosswalks that are mid block. And we have 11 locations that we're going to be installing rectangular rapid flashing beacons. And then we already have some um, that have been installed already along this corridor. And Mr. Chen, just to help address the question, we, there is a website dedicated to this SoCal Drive Buffered Project dot com that you had, that your team had created. SoCal Drive Buffered right. Project dot com that does have the map. Uh, that would, might be a little bit easier to view than than this right now. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions, Supervisor Hernandez? Thank you for those comments. Uh, we'll now open it up for the community. Anybody from the community like to address us on this item? Now is your opportunity. Anybody in chambers, please. Please. Good morning, board. I just had a few questions. I'm hearing a lot of comments about safety and managing congestion, but I'm not really seeing how that's going to improve congestion. Um, some of the pictures I saw looked like there was a narrowing to one, one lane rather than two lanes of traffic. And um, I've grown up in Santa Cruz County my entire life. So I've seen a lot of drastic changes through the uh, amount of people we have coming through here, through a lot of the traffic and congestion. But this looks like we're going in the direction of a 15 minute city um, to Supervisor Hernandez comments about people walking and biking to school. Is that where the board sees this going so that we're not gonna be able to drive around anymore? I'm really curious about your answers on all of that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Is there anybody else from the community uh, and chambers that would like to address us on this item? Uh, seeing none, is there anybody online that would like to address us on this item? Yes, Chair, we do have speakers online. Brian, your microphone is now available. Thank you, and I'll turn down my voice so you don't hear double. Brian Peoples with a uh, trail now. Uh, the great project, support it. You know, I just uh, want to recognize the community and thank them for the 2016 Measure D. We supported it, Trail Now. Actually, we originally opposed it, but fortunately, Supervisor Zach Friend adjusted the language um, and appreciate the effort he did. I do want to throw a little wet noodle on the discussion here that there are three transportation corridors, SoCal, Highway 1, and the Coastal Corridor. And the Coastal Corridor has remained closed for over a decade since the county or the RTC has owned it. And there are no current um, solid plans to opening up in a cost-effective manner. Actually, building the cost of building the trail right now, the plans, it actually costs more per mile than widening the highway. The reason is because of the misunderstanding about the legal aspects of rail making. Um, the commission is not following staff's guidance on the facts about rail banking. And we really encourage um, the commissioners to understand that rail banking and using the corridor today as a active transportation resource is in the best interests of our community. It preserves the right of way. It prevents the loss of it to private uh, adjacent properties. And it really can create a solution to have that trail all the way to Watsonville. Yes, all the way to Watsonville, not diverting. So we really want to encourage the commission here and the board here to look at that third corridor and help open it up. Thank you for your time. Call in user four, your microphone's now available. It sounds like something very disruptive and questionable if it's even needed. I'm thinking of a documentary called Taken for a Ride about how the automobile industry 
and, and the oil industry took out good transportation systems across the country, destroyed the environment, and put in this whole car um, mass transportation system. And are we being taken for a ride now? I have some questions. There's still a terrible echo. Is this, uh, why is this? And your voices don't sound as clear as they used to either. So here are my questions. Often I hear the word safety, and at closer examination, not safe, like the radar signs you have put near schools that tell your speed, additional microwaves, um, and the trees being cut down on Highway 1 makes me die. It's clear cut, it's horrible. What, ah, anyway, what part of this project involves more wireless microwave radiation with sensors, uh, et cetera? I would like to have an answer. Apologize that you continue to have that echo. We can hear you very clearly, though. Um, any other speakers online? That was our final speaker, Chair. All right, thank you. I'll bring it back to the board. I think Supervisor McPherson had a comment. Mr. Chin, uh, just to make it clear, I I didn't see anywhere where the four lanes on how Soquel Drive is reduced to two, uh, as a young lady was questioning. Is there any place where four lanes are reduced to two? No, there are no reductions in lane. <laughs> Only a reduction in lane widths. You, you just had to broaden. Uh, again, yeah. Okay, I just wanted to make that clear. Okay, That's thank you. And the question regarding uh, traffic congestion reduction, the adaptive signal projects will have a significant component to that as well, the Q jump or the, the priority lane, excuse me, elements for a metro. Um, as somebody also serves on the air district board, the adaptive signals are are significant in reducing traffic congestion as well as the amount of time that people are idling. And so I think that that would be, and they're very expensive by the way. And so this project helping cover that it, it will help answer that question that you had had in regards to that. Um, if there's no other questions from board members, it'd be appropriate now for a motion. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. I'll... All right, we have a motion from Supervisor Koenig and a second from Supervisor McPherson. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Chair Friend. Aye. Item passes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We'll move on to, thank you, Mr. Chen, for that thank presentation. You. We'd like to move on to item eight, which is to consider approval of amendment to contract number 21C4461 with Four Leaf Incorporated to include recovery permit services for storm damage repair and replacement projects to accept the report on CZ recovery permitting process uh, progress and direct staff to implement strategies to address rebuilding barriers and provide a path for recovery permit applicants to request review of determinations as outlined in the memo of the Deputy CAO, Director of Community Development and Infrastructure, we have the agenda item and board memo. We have the amendment to the contract. And with us today, we have uh, Carolyn Burke, who is our Assistant Director of, of Community Development and Infrastructure, and Matt Machado, who is our Deputy CAO and Director of CDI. Ms. Burke, welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Friend. Um, so today we're here to uh, discuss a contract amendment with Four Leaf for recovery permitting and give an update on CZU recovery permitting progress. Next slide. Uh, today we'll start with a little background and how we got here today. We'll discuss the details of the contract amendment and then we'll go into CZU recovery permitting covering uh, the metrics, um, supporting uh, determining the health of our rebuild, uh, our challenges and opportunities, and then we'll conclude with recommended actions. Slide. In August, 2020, um, Santa Cruz County experienced the CZU Lightning Complex fire, which is a historic fire that burned 86,500 acres and destroyed almost 1,500 structures. 
In November of 2020, uh, your board uh, signed the original contract with Four Relief Incorporated to provide streamlined recovery permit services in the recovery permit center located in the community room at 701 Ocean Street. Two and a half years later, in December and January of this year, the county was hit by another historic disaster with the atmospheric river that resulted in countywide flooding, storm surges, and wind gusts that caused widespread damages to commercial and residential buildings and infrastructure. Today, we are here at the direction of the board to consider extending the four leaf recovery permitting contract to include storm damage repairs because of the recent atmospheric river. Next slide. To cover the details of the contract uh, amendment, the original contract amount was for 6.26 million, and that's to cover streamlined permitting processing, including unlimited pre-application meetings, coordination of permit pre-clearances for septic, geology, and fire access, expedited building plan checks with a 10-day turnaround, and construction inspections. The payment model for the recovery permit services contract is that Four Leaf retains 75% of most permit fees to provide the service, and 25% is retained by the county for overhead costs. Depending on permit volume, the county pays the difference between the percentage of fee revenue and the cost of staffing the RPC. The proposed 2023 contract amendment does not increase the overall co cost of the contract, but does extend the contract expiration date to June 30th, 2024, and amends the scope of work to include the same recovery permit services for storm damage repair permitting, as well as next business day inspections and provisions for Cal OES Safety Assessment Program, or SAP, certified inspectors to assist in damage assessments if necessary to address future storm damage within the terms of the contract. Next slide. As directed by the board, we will now briefly cover some of the metrics that indicate the health of our CZU fire recovery. Next slide. From the permitting side, we can view the health of the recovery through the total number of dwelling permits that have been applied for and or issued. Our best estimate of the number of residences destroyed is the 911 noted by Cal County and Cal OES inspectors based on field observations after the fire. Of those 911 dwellings, 162 have issued permits, 24 have completed construction and are final, and 32 are in the building application review process. This means 20% of the total residences lost are either in construction or construction is complete. Next slide. Another way to view recovery progress is to establish how many parcels with destroyed structures have permits issued or in process. The total number of parcels that lost structures, both residential and non-residential, is 697, meaning many parcels could have had more than one residence lost that will likely be rebuilt over a period of time rather than simultaneously. Out of 697 parcels <clears throat> with excuse me, with destroyed structures, a total of 195 or 28% have issued dwelling permits or permit application in active review. 73 or 10% of parcels have approved pre-clearances and their next step is to apply for a building permit. 101 <clears throat> parcels or 15% are still working through the pre-clearance pre process and 328 or 40% 47% of parcels have not engaged in the pre-clearance or pre permit application process. To get an idea of how the CZ recovery compares to those in other jurisdictions, we can look to the Sonoma County Lightning Complex and glass fires that also occurred in 2020. Comparing all three, we see that Santa Cruz Cruz County's 28% of parcels with rebuild activity is on par with Sonoma County's 24 and 28% rebuild activity rates. This correlation may indicate that larger cross-jurisdictional factors, such as the timing of the fires during the early days of the pandemic, dire financial outlooks, and supply chain and employment interruptions may have influ influenced many decisions to rebuild or not rebuild. Next slide. To get more information on what is hindering our local rebuilders' ability to take the next step and apply for a building permit, OR3 issued a survey to the 73 parcels with approved pre-clearances who have yet to apply for a building permit. Almost 20% of those that received a survey responded with the following results. 91% of respondents cited financial limitation as a governing factor in their consideration to rebuild, with the leading financial challenge being the cost of construction. 
The majority of respondents noted that they had received bids of $500 to $600 per square foot. Those completing the survey indicated that their biggest pre-clearance challenges were around septic design and permitting, as well as geotechnical and geologic, and their biggest delay is finding a contractor. Mm -hmm. An interesting finding was that only 20% of respondents had connected with the long-term recovery group, and many had not heard of the group or their mission to provide financial support to rebuilders. It's clear that with financial hurdles noted by those rebuilding, a greater effort must be made to increase outreach regarding options for financial assistance from groups such as the Long-Term Recovery Group. We conducted our own preclearance analysis that looked at the 101 total parcels with preclearances applied for but not issued. Our findings agreed with the survey respondents that septic and geology were the preclearance areas of greatest concern. 89% of septic preclearances were unapproved, and 44% of geologic preclearances were not in approved status. Only 10% of fire access preclearances were outstanding at the time of our analysis. Bye. To determine how to assist fire survivors in overcoming the geology and septic constraints, we can revisit the policies created to assist CZU rebuilders. In the geologic arena, the board approved the CZU Rebuild Directive on August 10, 2021, to allow in-kind rebuilds undertaken by original owners to forego county code requirements for geologic analysis. So far, 10 parcels have gained geologic preclearance based on the CZU Rebuild Directive. Because the directive is only applied at the time of building permit application submittal, it is unknown how many of the 44 active geologic preclearances will be resolved via this the directive, but it is clear that this is an important tool for those in areas of geologic hazard, and it's prudent to maintain this avenue for preclearance and encourage in-kind construction to allow its widespread use. In contrast to geologic hazards, there have been no CZU-specific septic policies created for CZU rebuilding, largely because the county septic ordinances are govern, governed by a local agency management program that is approved by the state and cannot be altered without their approval. Unlike the Legacy Older Structures Program, authorized by the board to consider parcels developed prior to 1986 as legal nonconforming for zoning purposes, there is no analogous program to grandfather in septic systems. While county septic code allows reconstruction of a residence destroyed by calamity, the septic system must be upgraded to meet current standards. And for systems with no septic permit history, use of the existing system can require recordation of an acknowledgement on the parcel title. This recordation is a point of contention for many property owners. Suggestions to help rebuilders better understand how to navigate the septic approval process include clarifying policy triggers for recordation of acknowledgements and prescribing the circumstances under which pre-1986 structures without septic permit histories can use their existing septic system to serve their rebuilt residents. Next slide. <clears throat> Our analysis of the CZ recovery process yields some areas to focus on supporting in the months to come. As noted by Supervisor Cummings at the January 31st board meeting requested requesting this report back, rebuilders have asked for a path for review of the preclearance determinations made by RPC staff. An approach to formalizing this review is to hold a monthly meeting between RPC staff and county leadership to review determinations as requested by applicants and provide a written summary of outcomes to both the district supervisor's offices and applicants. In addition, we can pursue greater clarity on septic provisions and triggers for the recordation of an acknowledgement on title. And while the Legacy Older Structures Program com uh, con conference of legal nonconforming status does not extend to septic systems, it has remained an important tool for allowing replacement of limited housing stock and should be extended to include storm damage projects as well. Like, in summary, we ask that your board consider the following staff recommendations. First, we ask that you approve the amendment to contract uh, number 21C4461 with Fourleaf to include providing integrated recovery permit processing services for development permits to repair or reconstruct due to storm damage and extend the term of the contract through June 30th, 2024. 
We recommend that you accept the, this report on the metrics for CZ recovery and permitting process, progress, uh, strategies to address rebuilding barriers, and proposal to provide an avenue for CZU property owners to dispute preliminary determinations regarding requirements to rebuild. <clears throat> we uh, also um, ask that you direct staff to extend the legacy older structures program previously established within the CZU burn area to also confer legal non-conforming status for sites countywide that have been damaged or destroyed by the December 2022 and January 2023 atmospheric river winter storm events and are documented to have been developed prior to 1986. And lastly, we ask that you direct staff to develop a clear policy regarding the circumstances that require recordation of an acknowledgement of requirements for use of on-site sewage disposal system with special operating characteristics and investigate opportunities to extend the terms of the LOSP to specify circumstances under which in-kind replacement of pre-1986 structures with functioning on-site wastewater treatment systems can use existing systems without OWTS upgrade or replacement. And slide, that concludes our presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Berg. Anything, Mr. Machado, before we come back to the board? No? No, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, this is, you know, there's kind of two things at play here, and I appreciate that you have it bifurcated as the actions. Uh, Supervisor Koenig and I had brought forward a request for the extension of the contract uh, in the last meeting, in large part to ensure that those that were that suffered through the recent uh, storms, including many that actually have suffered through a dual issue in Supervisor McPherson and Cummings uh, districts had an opportunity to um, access the, the four leaf contract, have access to an expedited process. People have just been through so much to try and navigate the FEMA process or the SBA process and also the county process. So to have um, a dedicated component within our structure for storm damage repair as well as on the fire victims uh, was very important to us. Um, I recognize that Supervisor McPherson had some additional questions associated with this item, which is why he requested additional direction on some of the report. I think the report's outstanding. I think it helps provide clarity uh, to the board about what's going on. But Supervisor McPherson, I'll turn it over to you for questions on that item. Yeah, thank you, uh, Supervisor Friend, uh, Chair Friend. I, I want to thank our staff uh, for providing the report back to the board. And I know we've had many discussions going on. And, and while the additional information is uh, useful, I, I still don't think it fully addresses the additional direction from our January 31st meeting. And I think it's important to have a better, to better understand these issues before we move into the storm rebuilding efforts. Um, and I'd like the opportunity to ask additional questions to get more details on how we might help people move along the rebuilding process. And I know Supervisor Cummings, uh, and he said I could speak for him, uh, agrees to do the same, and he may be back here soon. So I'm in support of the contract extension. There's no question about that. And uh, the recommendations to extend the legacy older instruction uh, structures program on uh, the sites that were uh, impacted by the atmospheric storms. Uh, but I'd like to defer the discussion to the other items, uh, to the, f the future study session to give um, us and our staff more time uh, to evaluate the rebuilding challenges and consider additional strategies. Now, I don't want to have this go on forever. It's gone on too long, as we've heard even today. But I would like to uh, make a motion to that effect when it's appropriate. Um, and uh, I know that uh, I would like to have had this decision made today overall, but I just feel more comfortable if it, to address these types of issues and especially the atmospheric storm issue that is uh, compounded this whole issue uh, that uh, we we delay this until um, I go along with the the contract with four leaf but delay some of the further discussions until uh, on items two and three of the four recommendations uh, and I know that's not going to make some members happy but I I just want to try to get it right and have a real set. Um, view of how we're going to uh, proceed in this. Uh, and I think we're going to be able to do it more quickly if we answer some of the questions that I might have at that time. Supervisor McPherson, if I could, just as a point of clarification, you had said that you supported the legacy older structures program. That's actually item three that you just said to defer. Do you mean item, I just want to clarity. Right. You, you want to item defer one, to- four, I'm, I'm supportive of two and three. Yeah, I'd like to. Uh, okay, I think that we're, we're getting confused. So let me just, do you have the item in front of you about what the recommended actions are? So the first, 
Yeah. The recommended action is the contract. The contract and the, and the four is to direct uh, staff to uh, develop a clear policy. So you, you are not supportive right now of the legacy older structures Correct. program extension? Yeah, two and three, I'd okay. like to delay. Okay. I mean, it, I, I believe that you had said the exact opposite just now and so I, during your comments. And so I just want to be 100% sure that, yeah, that it is two it. and three that you want to delay. Right. Okay. Uh, Supervisor Koenig. Uh, my understanding is three is is just extending the legacy older structures program that was established in the CZU burn area to sites in the that were suffered suffered storm damage. Uh, are you sure that's the item that you uh, don't support today? Or are you believe uh, Supervisor McPherson that you think the legacy older structures program itself needs to be reevaluated before being extended? I'd like to yeah, I'd like to have more questions asked on that. And, um, just to discuss it further uh, we have discussed this with the staff and they've been more than cooperative and uh, uh but i would just like to continue this uh, until march 13th on items number two and three and and approve uh, one and four and i know supervisor cummings uh, felt feels the same way but um you know i wish he'll be back maybe to speak for himself here pretty soon can i ask staff how that would impact the amendment uh, for number one. It strikes me that one and three have are are sort of co-associated in a way, um, and and so I want to ensure. I mean, if, if we're yeah. right, if we're if we're trying to ensure wait that, that okay, wait a minute, wait. Let me think. Well, I was uh, let uh, let me let me continue the question. So so does three? I I said I I would like uh, to move the red recommended actions of one and three and defer two and four. Okay, now I'm living you got it. In, in, in a confusing world. Yeah, I got but, it. But okay, so that is what you that is what you said originally. But then the numbers got confused, and now I think the world is confused. So okay. so 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 one and three. I I, I I know I can make the motion now or wait. And I think we want to get some input. Uh, but but the idea is to approve one and three. Got it. And defer two and four. That makes more sense to me. Got it. Okay, uh, Supervisor. Hernandez, you had comments? Uh, well, after they just switched it, I, I don't have the comment. No okay. more. Okay. Supervisor Cohen, I don't believe you had finished yet either. I apologize. Uh, my only comment is I wanted to thank staff. The item that Chair Friend and I had brought forward was simply asking for an extension of the four relief contract and the uh, access to the recovery permit center for uh, folks who had suffered storm damage. And I appreciate that you guys went above and beyond and looked at really all the ways that we could help uh, folks who had have suffered storm damage, including extending the legacy older structures program, uh, which is item, item recommendation three, um, as well as offering the next day building inspection. Um, so to me, I'm, I'm seeing that uh, we're taking everything that we've learned here so far with uh, the CZU rebuild process and are extending that to storm damage survivors. Um, and I know that we'll continue that process of, uh, of learning and identifying new ways to improve the, the process overall. I think it is worth recognizing that originally the recovery permit center was something we stood up um, in response to the CZU fires, but was, was really only for uh, re residents of District 3 and 5 as a result of that localized disaster. And now as we see yet another disaster impacting our county, every supervisorial district has homes um, that are going need to need to take advantage of it. So um, hopefully we'll just keep getting better at this because it's clearly an issue that's not going away. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. And just, just for a point of clarity for the community, the recommended actions of Supervisor McPherson, uh, when the time's come for a motion, is recommending number one, which is approve amendment to the contract with four relief, and number three, which is direct staff to extend the Legacy Elder Structures Program uh, to also include uh, the atmospheric river events. Supervisor Hernandez. I was going to ask if the motion can be repeated, but... Um... You know, I think being that it's in in both uh, Supervisor Cummings and McPherson's district, um, but it, if we make sure that both Supervisor and and Supervisor McPherson and uh, Cummings uh, meet with staff uh, before the March oh, sure. meeting and make sure that they agenda or that they meet with staff to discuss 
and uh, discuss the questions that they have with staff so that we're ready by the March meeting and we can expedite this process in March meeting. Uh, I'd, I'd second his motion for his this, uh, items one and three. Thank you. And I to move forward with items two and and I'm confused. Two and four at the March meeting. I mean, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, that we, we the direction was specifically to bring this information back immediately. You're in the middle of a disaster. You turned it around immediately, and now the board is punting. And I want to apologize to you on that because I think it's an unreasonable ask of staff to have to come back on this. But that's my. But we can have a disagreement on that. But you were asked to do something. You did it well, and and here we are. But the one and three are definitely the most important parts. I think to the two of us that brought forward this item in the first place. Um, and so we'll look forward to moving forward with that today. Okay. We'd like to now open it up for the community for discussion on this item. Morning, sir. By the way, thank you for uh, waiting to speak for this item. I appreciate it. I'm retired. <laughs> I have some time. So um, my name is Steve Holman, and I support the extension and refocusing of the contract. Uh, my wife and I built our first home in Bonnie Dune and moved in in 76. I'm a registered environmental health specialist and I have experience working for 25 years in three counties, including this one and 15 years as a private consultant. I was retired. Uh, we had no difficulty with four leaf and rebuilding our home, but we were early on in the debris removal and permit process. Um, about the time that we obtained our building permit in the summer of 2021, I noticed that other people were starting to have serious difficulties in obtaining environmental health clearance from Four Leaf. I started helping people as a consultant at no charge. Since the summer of 2021, I have counseled many CZU fire families. I worked for 28 of them, using the verifiable facts from county permit files, the county sewage disposal ordinance, and the county environmental health policies of the director. The decisions of a Four Leaf staff member have been overturned 22 times by Four Leaf management, three times by the Director of Environmental Health, and one time by the Director of the Department of Community Development and Infrastructure. Two cases are pending. I should not be having to do this work. It's Four Leaf's job to look for creative solutions to try to help people not to throw up roadblocks and look for problems. It's a serious problem at Four Leaf in the areas of sewage disposal and water supply review. In-kind replacement homes are too often improperly considered new construction with different regulations. I'm supporting and I'm supporting the extension of the contract because overall the work they do is good and helpful, and I'm hopeful that county administration is on the path to correcting the problems. The problems that need to be addressed used to be just third and fifth district problems, as you said, sir. But now they're, with the atmospheric river storm damage, they're problems for every county supervisor. Uh, I did send you an email asking for um, amendments to the contract for uh, responses to be responsive by time certain. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holman. Thank you again for waiting. Welcome back, sir. Um, I know you spoke broadly to this item, so just try and narrow the comments specifically to the action items that we have. Well, I'm going to uh, narrow it up to my experiences, direct experiences with a four leaf. <clears throat> and that is in September 2020, my client and I work really closely together. She's an old client of mine, so I'm trying to protect her and not spend her money foolishly. But we filed for permits uh, in September. We were there together. I went back in April for more paperwork, they couldn't find her file. We had to file it again, the same paperwork we filled out in September. I went back in August to file some more paperwork. They couldn't find her file. I got aggressive, granted, I'm sorry. But then she said, well, I'm not waiting on you because you're too aggressive. I said, I'm not moving out of this chair until you take the paperwork I filled out for three times now and get it in that computer. I'm going to watch you scan it into your system. And she did. Now I'm Mr. Rizzuto when I walk in there. However, okay, I don't like the county spending my clients' money foolishly, okay? They wanted a winter grading uh, plan. I had already graded already. Another $3,000 because they wouldn't let me go. They wanted an erosion plan. I covered everything with plastic. Another $3,000. Then the first pour, they wanted a concrete test. Another $1,000. I mean, when does it stop here, okay? It's just a house. It's not a high rise. She lost everything. She's a single woman, a school teacher, ready to retire. She has lost everything. And then the state contractor showed up to clean her house and they screwed up the site. They cost, they're going to cost her $100,000 because they took out a walkway, an 80 foot long, eight foot wide, exposed aggregate walkway 
And what does the workman say to her personally? Oh, shit, we're on the wrong side. We got the wrong address. We're sorry. Hey, what do we do here now, guys? I'm asking you, you're the supervisors. You're supposed to protect the taxpayers. I was on a school board for six years. I protected the taxpayers. It's your turn now. I don't recommend four leaf. I think they're ambulance chasers. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody else like to address us from chambers on this item? Good morning. Welcome. My name's Chris Holman. You heard from my husband, Steve. Um, he spoke about the practical um, aspects of building. I want to speak about the emotional aspects of building. We lost our home of 44 years in the CZU fire. We went through the process of cleanup in December. We got our preliminary clearance in January. We sailed through the process. Um, Four Leaf was wonderful. They They listened to what we had to say. Steve had 26 questions at the first meeting. Um, she got all the answers to the questions. We got our preliminary clearance with no problem. We are, have moved back into our home. <clears throat> so we sailed through the process. It worked for us. What you said at the beginning about building back in kind worked for us. We built back in kind. However, it's not working for my neighbors at all. We have neighbors who have waited eight months for preliminary clearance. Eight months on a site they had a home and an ADU. They, they were there, those homes were there for years. They had septic systems that worked for years and they've been tortured for eight months by one member of the Four Leaf group. That needs to change, that needs to be fixed. They're not the only neighbors that have had this problem. I have watched Steve work with people over and over and listen to people's stories. He was retired, he didn't wanna be doing this. But he did it because I convinced him to. You need to fix this problem because it's not right for you to say people can build back in kind and then someone on some staff somewhere is making it impossible for that to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else I'd like to address us from Chambers? All right, uh, Madam Clerk, is there anybody online? Yes, Chair. Call in user five, your microphone is now available. Listening to the of the two previous speakers is very compelling that you should not approve a contract with four leave. You should rescind it. The board of supervisors should represent the well-being of the members of the community, not of a corporation that is um, not benefiting public, but harming members of the public. And I think also on the agenda, you have $32 million for telecare. Telecare, does not have a good record of taking care of the public. What is the board doing if they are not genuinely providing for the well-being of the public? Do not approve this contract amendment or leave. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Anybody else online? We have no further speakers online, Chair. Hi, my name is James Ewing Whitman. I'll be brief. I wish I would have spoken on an earlier item. 20 years ago, this county had the largest building department in the state. And it's the smallest county in the state. So I just hope that uh, all the people that have had less than perfect things to say about Four Leaf, I hope that um, they get really good assistance. It'd be great to have them come back and say, hey, things really improved. So way you guys can help the citizens out here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. By the way, Alpine County has 1,200 residents in California, so I think we're slightly higher than that. We're about halfway through on the population. We're the second smallest geographic county, but, you know, we'll get those facts. Is there anybody else in the board chambers that would like to address us? 
Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board for action. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I'd like to um, recommend the that we approve action or the action items one and three and defer action on two and four and uh, direct staff to schedule a study session on Mar March 14th to discuss items uh, two and four. Second. I uh, uh, just point of clarification from council. Study session can lead to action on items, correct? It's, it actually just depends on the action. So, so we'll we'll um, we'll have a study section uh, to discuss, and if if the actions coming out of the study section uh, study session um, are fully and reasonably relate to what we're talking about, um, we can take action. Okay. So it, what I'm what I'm hoping for is not to have a study session that leads to another meeting that leads to another meeting. So if that can be done, then I'll approve a study session component of it. Okay. All right. We have a motion and a second. Any additional uh, questions? Chair, excuse me, Chair, if we could just please restate who seconded the motion. Uh, Supervisor Hernandez, my mistake. It was, um, if we get a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Friend. Aye. Item passes as amended. Thank you. Thank you. I'll move on to item nine, which is to consider a presentation and update on the invasive 80s mosquitoes found in Santa Cruz County in October of 2022 is outlined in the memo of the Agricultural Commissioner. We have uh, the board item and attached presentation. And we're going to have a presentation from uh, Amanda Polson, the Assistant Vector Control Manager. And I believe we also have Dave Sanford, our Interim Agricultural Commissioner. Welcome back. Good to see you again. And uh, please go ahead and begin. Yep. I'm Amanda Polson. I'm checking to confirm. There we go. Hello? Okay. Uh, good morning. I'm Amanda Polson, the assistant manager with Mosquito and Vector Control with the county. Um, we are essentially a public health agency under the Ag Commissioner's Office for Santa Cruz. Oh. Um, today I'm here to talk about the invasive mosquito we found in October. Um, and its name is Aedes aegypti. First, I'll start with providing some background on the mosquito, who it is and why we should care. Next, I'll provide an update on the neighborhood finding we had in Watsonville. And lastly, we'll cover what our next steps are. How do we manage this mosquito moving forward now that it's here? So Aedes aegypti is commonly known as the yellow fever mosquito. It's pictured here on the left. Um, to the naked eye, it looks black and white. Um, and how we tell it apart from our native species is this violin shape on its thorax, which is the part of the body that the head is attached to. This mosquito is native to tropical and subtropical regions of the world, which are highlighted in red and yellow on this map. Um, and you know those are areas with high rainfall and high temperatures. And this mosquito is really important to these regions of the world because they can transmit diseases like Zika, dengue, chikungunya, and its namesake, yellow fever. Additionally, this mosquito where it's native, it's had a lot of time to evolve with humans and our stuff. It really likes living in yards um, and studies show that this mosquito actually prefers to bite humans over other hosts. Um, and on the right here, it shows a container with the mosquito's eggs. And this mosquito likes to glue its eggs to different containers that we might have around the home. Additionally, they can even breed indoors. They've been found in toilets, houseplants, uh, humidifiers, and Christmas tree water. Pictured here is a life cycle of this mosquito. Um, one thing to note is that it has a pretty fast life cycle. It can go from an egg to an adult in about seven days under the right conditions. And another important thing to note here and really how this mosquito stands apart from our native mosquitoes is again, that container breeding behavior. Additionally, the eggs laid by this mosquito can lie dormant and they can withstand drying for up to a year. Um, and so, you know, that's a key reason why this mosquito is so invasive. If you think about it, you know, say I live in an area where this mosquito is present, but I'm moving to Santa Cruz County. So I might pack my buckets, my plants, my containers with me. And when I move to my new location in Santa Cruz County, all it could take is some rain or my sprinklers going off to then trigger these eggs to hatch and start this life cycle all over again and potentially start a new infestation in my neighborhood. 
So why is this mosquito so dangerous? Well, at minimum, they are aggressive daytime biters. We're used to mosquitoes in our area that kind of wait till dusk or dawn to be active. But these mosquitoes, they're out when we're out. Um, so they're, they go after us um, when we're outside. Additionally, these mosquitoes can leave really itchy bites. Um, because they're not native, we're not used to their saliva, our immune systems might react more strongly than our native mosquitoes to the bites and they're really itchy and irritating. Um, and also these mosquitoes bite multiple times before they're full. Our native mosquitoes, they might bite us, um, get full and they move on to lay their eggs. Whereas these mosquitoes, they've, their behavior is they'll bite you, you know, they'll bite one person in a household. They can move on to another person and take a little bit of more blood and a little bit of more blood from another person. So, you know, they're, they're in a sense, a flying hypodermic needle, right? If, if you're, you live in an area where diseases like Zika, dengue, chikungunya, or yellow fever are present, um, this mosquito can bite one person in the household, get infected with the virus, and then pass it on to someone else pretty efficiently. It is important to note, though, that we haven't seen local transmission of these diseases in California. Um, you know, thankfully, that we haven't found it yet. Um, however, the potential is there, right? We do have a lot of people who travel to places where these diseases are endemic and all it takes is returning home to an area with Aedes aegypti um, to allow this potential of a local outbreak. Um, and we have seen local transmission of these diseases in places like Florida, Hawaii, and Texas. So where has this mosquito invaded? I already mentioned Hawaii, Texas, and Florida, um, but for the most part, these mosquitoes are pretty comfortable in the Southern United States. And if we zoom into California, these mosquitoes were first introduced in 2013 in Southern California. And ever since they've made their way through the Central Valley as far north as Shasta County. Shasta County gets a lot colder than Santa Cruz County um, and they've been able to survive multiple seasons up there. And, you know, I want to take a pause on this slide here and mention climate change. If we think about shorter winters, more moderate winters, and higher temperatures overall, this mosquito does have the potential to continue expanding its range. So what does life with Aedes aegypti look like? Um, well, what it boils down to is eradication versus management. I think with the infestation that we found in Watsonville, we do have a pretty good shot at eradicating the mosquito at this point. Um, you know, but that in contrast, Southern California, mosquito and vector control districts down there, they don't talk about eradication anymore. They're just trying to manage the mosquito. And what that means is attempting to keep mosquito populations low enough where they don't see local transmission of diseases. And pictured on the left, you know, it, it could change the way we enjoy the outdoor spaces. Um, it might mean covering your picnic areas in your backyard. And on the right, um, this is a PSA from Greater LA Mosquito and Vector Control, suggesting that you should wear repellent even to just spend some time in your backyard. So what about Watsonville? Well, let's go ahead and zoom in. We were alerted to this area and the finding um, by someone calling us. They let us know that they were experiencing mosquito bites more than normal in their backyard. Um, so we set some traps, we followed up, um, and sure enough, we found Aedes aegypti. Thankfully, this mosquito only has about a quarter of a mile flight range. And so we set traps within that buffer to see how far it might have spread and how you know prolific was this infestation. On the right is just a picture of some different traps that we used. And all the data really points to this population being isolated. Um, you know, we only found adult mosquitoes and larvae within the inner block of this neighborhood. They hadn't even crossed the street yet. So I think we're lucky. Uh, <laughs> I'm crossing my fingers, but it, it really shows that, well, from the data we have, it shows that we caught this early and this is our chance to try and, um, you know, eradicate the mosquito at this time. <laughs> So where are we going with this? How do we manage this mosquito moving forward? Um, so we're closely following recommendations by the California Department of Public Health and their principles you know, follow integrated pest management. Integrated pest management is a combination of using education, reducing mosquito breeding habitat, using mosquito control materials and surveillance so that we can really hone in on this mosquito and try to eliminate it at this time. 
Um, when we first found this mosquito back in October, uh, we did door to door inspections through the neighborhood. Um, you know, it took a lot of staff time and energy. Um, so I want to thank my staff. I also want to thank the neighborhood too. Um, they were really cooperative and worked with us to get as rid of as many containers as possible and protect themselves from this infestation. And this is the first time we've seen Aedes aegypti in our coastal climate. So we're not really sure what it's going to look like after this winter. Um, we're hopeful that the winter was on our side, um, but essentially, you know, we're, we're gonna go back in at the end of this month in this neighborhood and see if we can find any evidence of this mosquito anymore. What we do know is that this mosquito, um, its eggs can hatch if we have seven consecutive days of 70 degrees, 70 degree temperatures or higher. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're not quite sure where this is going yet and, and if they're gonna survive, but we're gonna be looking for them. Our next steps also include continuing with comprehensive trapping. Pictured on the left is the neighborhood and each dot in that neighborhood represents a place where we've been able to put one of our specialized traps. Again, we're really thankful for the neighborhood here. I mean, they've let us into their homes and their backyards um, to help us control this mosquito. And lastly, we also are going to use environmentally compatible control products. And what that means for mosquito and vector control is using larvicides at this stage. Larvicides are products that we use to knock down mosquitoes at the larval stage before they're able to become an adult that can fly around and bite people and potentially transmit disease. All the products we use are EPA registered um, and the majority of them are organic. And the product we're looking for that's recommended for this type of control is organic. It's derived from a soil bacteria that's incompatible with the mosquito's gut. So it's very specific um, and used in very small concentrations. So with continued inspections, comprehensive trapping, and using control methods, we still need the community's help. Um, it's really important, even if you don't live around the detection area, um, to minimize containers in your backyard. Bag and discard any containers that you don't need and dump and scrub any containers that you do want to keep. Because again, the scrubbing is because these mosquitoes glue their eggs to the edges of containers. And then, you know, secondly, we were notified about this finding from a neighbor who was paying attention to mosquitoes in their backyard. So if anybody in the public notices higher mosquito activity than normal, please give us a call or report it online. Um, and lastly, here's just a list of our additional service we offer, services we offer to the community. And thank you for your time. And I'm happy to take any questions now. Well, thank you. I mean, they're outstanding work by your team to uh, control it early and also a remarkable amount of credit to the community member that saw an abnormality and decided to reach out. So to even have the wherewithal to do that is is outstanding. I appreciate your outreach. Are there any uh, board members who would like to comment on this or are you all sufficiently scared now <laughs> and would rather not say anything? Uh, Supervisor Koenig, please. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just, I just also want to thank you, Ms. Paulson, for that, for the quick work, but also for, for your continued work. I mean, not a lot of people realize everything that mosquito and vector control is doing for us on a day-to-day -day basis, um, but uh, clearly it's incredibly important, and um, it's great to know about this issue so that we can make sure more people are aware and uh, have more eyes and ears on the problem. Um, I will definitely be dumping and scrubbing uh, <laughs> Thank for you. all my house plants. Yeah. Any other board members? Uh, Supervisor Hernandez. And I, I just have to say thank you for all the work in South County. We did have a that neighborhood that was uh, we had a little scare there off East Lake um, Hecker Pass. And also, I want to thank you guys. You know, I, I mentioned in the past, I I kind of did know what uh, the Mosquito Vector District did. I, I researched it and tried to get some information from the vector control back in 28, 2019 before I went to uh, our sister city visit in, in Hokotepec. They had an outbreak of uh, dengue, the mosquito bite. They had a big lake and they had asked for some materials and you guys gave me some materials that I took over there and had used all the materials that we I brought over from from you guys. So thank you for that as well. So I did have some knowledge of everything you guys did prior to even being on the board of supervisors. And thank you for all the work you guys did, the uh, prompt work that you guys did to stop any, you know, further outbreak of 
uh, mosquitoes out there in, in the fourth district. Thank you. Is there any member of the community? I believe this is a non-action item because it says consider a report, but uh, is there any member of the community that would like to address us on this item? Please step forward. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to know where I can find your report. I am a scientist. I am someone who spends a lot of time outdoors. And last year, um, my sports friends and I were concerned that there were going to be some GMO mosquitoes released into California. And we were not told where those GMO uh, mosquitoes were going to be released. You stated that this species came to California in 2013, but you didn't say how. I think it's really interesting that it's shown up in this neighborhood, could have been put there. Um, can you make any comments regarding these genetic modified Genetically modified mosquitoes use the word flying hypodermic needle, and believe you me, we were concerned about what these engineered mosquitoes could do to humans and animals. Um, so those are definitely some questions I have. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other member of the community inside chambers? Is there any member online that would like to address us? Yes, we do have a speaker online. Call in user five. Your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, due to the previous speaker, answer her question. Do not disregard the questions that are put to you. Also read about the genetically engineered mosquitoes. Also, I'm reading a book, and there's a section here on Zika. Part of what your report says is in threat. And I want to point that out. The book is called The Real Anthony Fauci, Bill Gates, Big Pharma, and the Global War on Democracy and Public Health by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Page 366 has a section on Zika. 2016 Zika. In March of 2016, Dr. Fauci again misled the public, this time into believing that the Zika virus was causing an epidemic of microcephaly among newborn babies in Brazil. One thing we know for sure, Zika doesn't cause microcephaly. Zika was endemic to Central America and much of South Asia for many generations with no reported association with microcephaly. Dr. Fauci's critics claimed that an experimental DPT vaccine administered to pregnant women in 2015 to 16 in the slums of Northeast Bill as the likely culprit for the rave wave. Is there any other person online? We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, we'll bring it back to the board and just to help address some of the questions that were asked, actually the, um, they have a website, which is actually ag, A-G-D-E-P-T for agdepartment.com. And you can click on the mosquito section and there's the reports actually on there, the educational materials are on there and information about uh, what they use and how they address is actually all available on there. Um, if there's something else you'd like to add, please. Yes. Um, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to clarify, the mosquitoes that we found are not genetically engineered. Um, we actually have sent some of our samples to UC Davis and they're going to run some genetics to give us a sense of where they came from. Um, because at this point in the United States, as I showed the map earlier, um, we do have a lot of different populations of Aedes aegypti. Um, so we're curious to know, you know where they came from and that might give us some, some hints on how they were introduced in our county. All right, it's a non-action item, so that will end uh, thank you for the presentation. It was outstanding. You did a wonderful job. And uh, we're going to move on to closed session. Is there anything anticipated to be reportable out of closed session? No. And Chair, right. if I may, just for the record, uh, Supervisor Cummings did return to us at 1044 in the morning. So we'll note that in the minutes. Thank you. All right. Our next regular scheduled meeting is February 28th in this location at 9 a.m. Thank you.
Still managing. Yeah.